Well, hello everyone and welcome to this week's Crunch Seminar. This week we would be having four talks, uh, two from, uh, two from uh, new researchers across the globe and two talks would be at the end would be from two Crunch members who would be leaving our group very soon. So our first talk today is from Orno Bray. He is a senior research fellow and is finishing his PhD under the supervision of Dr. Debakar Ghosh from the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, India. His research topic focuses on the origination of extreme events in nonlinear dynamical systems. His research interest lies in the data-driven prediction of extreme weather events using machine learning approach. So uh, without any further ado, let, uh, let's all welcome Orno for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, should I share my screen? Please, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I have time 30 minutes, right? You have uh, an hour time. Okay, okay, one hour. So, so thank you. Thank you very much uh, for for this uh, opportunity for giving the opportunity for this talk. So um, I I prepared a small talk and uh, this talk on the understanding the origin of extreme events and forecasting of extreme events using machine learning approach. And uh, it's uh, based on my uh, two uh, two published paper. So, so just I move here. So I introduce myself first. I am Onobra and I am doing PhD from Statistic, Indian Statistical Institute. And my main uh, research topic focused on the origination of extreme events in deterministic dynamical systems. So, um, uh, we, uh, so everybody know about uh, extreme events. So it's uh, coming from in my in our mind or head. There's extreme low waves or extreme precipitation events or stock market crash. But it's uh, natural events uh, or or it's artificial events. But in nonlinear dynamical systems. We also observed some phenomena like like that. This is a temporal dynamics where the oscillations bounce within a small region, but occasionally it goes for a long excursion and again it comes within a small bounded region. And this temporal dynamics is just similar to these kinds of extreme events. So in nonlinear dynamical systems, these events are called extreme events. So my research topic focus on how this kind of extreme events in chaotic dynamical system occurs. In 2007, when a group of researchers just focus on optical rogue waves and they just found by, by numerically solved of Schrodinger equation, they found these kinds of large events and they called optical rogue waves because they found it in optical system. But after that, a new, new research topic just open, open up and where we observed extreme, extreme like events in nonlinear dynamical system. And uh, this is found in uh, ordinary differential equations, just to model. Uh, so first, I just present here, the how an extreme events occurs in nonlinear dynamical systems. So here, this is a, ordinary differential equation of low dimensional ordinary differential equation, which describes El Nino Southern oscillation phenomena. And here, 
this is a slow so fast dynamical system where t1 and t2 depicts the equatorial sea surface temperature of western and eastern pacific And 2003, Timmerman and his group just find out, found out these dynamical systems. And here, they locate a parameter, parameter space, where they found that El Nino, El Nino events, which is just similar to the real world data sets. In this model, I just try to find out how these extreme events and El Nino events occurs. That means which nonlinear which nonlinear process is responsible for origination of these kinds of events. So in my paper, just I uh, find out the uh, I solve this uh, dynamical system and. Uh, find out the uh, equilibrium points. And uh, we analyze the stability uh, by um, analytically. But we found a equilibrium point, which is solved numerically. And in XPP auto, we, we just find out how this equilibrium point change its stabil stability with respect to a bifurcation parameter. And this bifurcation parameter is called the strength of zonal advection. This is epsilon. And all meanings of these uh, parameters are include this uh, paper. And uh, this is uh, some physical, uh, physical interpretation. But I focus here just the the nonlinear process. So when Timmerman et al. just to look at that in this parameter value of epsilon, where the temporal dynamics show the chaotic mixed mode oscillation, here they just uh, told that this is just similar behavior of El Nino events in real life. Now, I focus on how this, this area uh, or this situation occurs. And for this, we just depict a bifurcation plot with respect to the bifurcation parameter epsilon and here we observe that chaotic dynamics emerge via interior crisis. And what is interior crisis? Interior crisis is a phenomena where small bounded chaotic oscillation suddenly enlarge. And this interior crisis, and this is the nonlinear process, which is responsible for originating extreme events. We also observe that near this critical value of epsilon, critical value where interior crisis emerge, we observe this kind of temporal dynamics where the large spikes occurs and infrequently. And this inter-event inter, inter occurrence interval of that large spikes is larger than this mixed mode oscillation. Can I, can I ask so, a question? So I think yeah. I think what you show here with the period uh, doubling cascade is that you show the first bifurcation, then a few period double doublings, and then the yeah. crisis happens, right? Do we, do you know how many cycles, how many bifurcations before it hits, before the crisis hits, or it, it's random? So there's like well, the first, the first one, the first bifurcation, and then another yeah. bifurcation, right? And then somewhere there yeah. you point, but I was wondering if there is a, a determine a, a, a specific number of period doublings before you see the uh, crisis. Uh, no, 
because here large here already uh, chaotic oscillation occurs okay okay we we, we only uh, captured uh, two period double where here and here but this is uh, narrow region where already chaos occurs and after that sudden large amplitude oscillation occurs and this interior interior crisis occurs due to collision between period doubling cascades and period adding cascades from the left side we observe period doubling cascade and from the right, right side we observe period adding cascades so due to this collision interior crisis occurs and also we just microscopic uh, microscopically we also observed how it occurs so for this we just move switch to next slide so here uh, this is a, a just a general formulation of slow first dynamical system i already Uh, told that this is a slow first dynamical system and here h1 is slow variable and t1 t2 is fast variables so we also know that if we uh, if we solve the differential algebraic equation and we can find the critical manifold so how it occurs if we solve f f is the uh, coefficient of fast variable so if we solve this this right side of this equation then we found the critical manifold and the critical manifold i draw here and this green region is critical manifold s s like curve and also we analysis stability analysis of the critical manifold so so how it can be done so this is the differential equation and if we take it as f and this is a we take it the function of f1 and f2 then we found the jacobian and after that we just find out the um, eigen values if the eigen values are all uh, positive real part then its repelling part and negative real part this is attractive part and otherwise it saddle now a interesting phenomena occurs here so this is this red dot is the saddle saddle point this is unstable saddle point so now if epsilon is less than the critical manifold Uh, less than the critical point of epsilon it is small bounded region then we observe that that the chaotic trajectory that is small bounded oscillation just oscillates just round the repelling part of critical manifold uh, i you know this region this short region and and it at its oscillates around this manifold but when we just tune the epsilon and it crosses the critical value of epsilon where interior crisis emerge then we observe that due to the enlargement of chaotic oscillation chaotic region it enters that region and its go to the the red stable red unstable orbit or oh sorry unstable equilibrium point and it repels and large excursion and due to large excursion large amplitude large amplitude oscillation occurs so i repeat first it goes to the saddle focus and so this then it spiral out and a large amplitude oscillation occurs 
and again it goes to saddle focus via stable manifold so this is the micros microscopic observation of us so how this kind of oscillation occurs and this is our main main focus or object of our of this paper so how this kind of sub oscillation at fixed mode oscillation or or large amplitude oscillations occurs so switch to this work i just move to another work where a data driven prediction of extreme events uh, we just perform it using machine learning and for this we formulate a optimized ensemble deep learning approach so here uh, so two approaches are we use one is deep learning approach and another one is ensemble learning and both are permissible tools for prediction of any any times any time series time evolution so so we predict extreme events of nonlinear dynamical systems so what do we do we just uh, we take three experts experts or deep learning algorithms one is fit forward neural network another one is reservoir computer and another one is lstm and we show that if i take combination of three results instead of individuals it gives better results than individual so i repeat so if f1 f2 f3 is my three forecast expert forecasting result then we take convex combination so best convex combination of three experts gives better result than individual one so it based on this results and this is our main problem so uh, so this is the uh, convex combination and we minimize it and we find out this suitable alpha alpha is the um, coefficient convex coefficient and this is our target and it based on this result and this published in 2018 paper actually instead of this we just minimize this mean square error so this is our results and again we okay so again we move to a dynamical system which exhibits extreme events and then we use our just ensemble approach our approach just show this is the, our rmsc results and our proposed oedl is better than other results and this is can you tell us can you tell us what is the input what's the output can you describe uh, we are interested in the machine learning aspect so can you describe a little bit of what goes in what goes out what is how many layers what is how do you choose the networks and so on um okay okay uh so uh, i just come here at first input and output uh so so i uh, i just tell it with this example and we take a real world data sets here and here uh 1634 data points we take and 80% we take as a training data sets and 20% testing data sets again if we take here then we just take the max local maxima of all all points okay local local maxima actually uh, in dynamical systems we define extreme events as the local local maxima of this temporal dynamics so here red red dot is the local maxima and this is our extreme events 
Okay. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. This is uh, this is uh, not the real system, right? Because in a real system, you don't have that so yeah. many extreme events. So you have uh, uh, so you undersample the the extreme events. So here you you put as many as you want, but that's not the, the problem. Okay. So uh, this is a synthetic system. Here, uh, four four thousand five hundred data sets we take as training data sets. Sorry, uh, forty-five thousand data sets we take as training data sets, and five thousand data sets we take as testing. Also, this is a one step one forward step approach, one step ahead prediction we perform here. Okay. This is not real data sets. We take real data sets as ENSO events, El Nino thousand, El Nino events, and uh, here are one six three four data points. And within this 80 percent, we use as training, and twenty percent as training. And but where is the where is the extreme event? So 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 long, so far you were talking about emphasize so much the extreme event. I don't see an extreme event in here. In, in not in the real data. Where is the extreme event? Okay, okay, okay. So actually, uh, actually, we take a long, long period of of sea surface temperature. This is the data of sea surface temperature. Okay, and and between between this time, uh, obviously, El Nino events occurs. So El Nino events in just includes in these data sets. This is uh, this is the temporal dynamics of sea surface temperature between uh, 1990 to 2021, and in between in between this uh, time range, obviously El Nino occurs. So so here also extreme events includes. Actually, we just uh, we just forecast the time series. And that time series, which consists of extreme events, not only we just observe extreme events, we we observe events where extreme events includes. Like this is our testing data, where this is just events. This is not extreme events. Extreme events are those which ex exceed this threshold. And and this is also captured here. And these thresholds are based on a statistical measures, which is uh, mean, mean plus eight times of standard deviation. So can I proceed? Yes, please. Or have you any question? Okay. Uh, so your another uh, question is so. Architecture of reservoir, uh, feed for neural, neural network, reservoir computer, and LSTM. So for this, we just uh, I just want to open my paper, original paper. So this is our paper where I just include the network architecture. Includes here. So this is our description, and here we just put all all things of just. Uh, we are we are familiar with the architectures. I didn't mean that. I mean the the size, uh, the size. I, I we we know, we know these architectures. Yeah, I just I just find out. Okay, I, I just uh, tell you after some time. Okay, so just
I think it's fine. You can proceed with your talk. Please. Don't yeah, go back to your PowerPoint. You can proceed. Okay, okay. Actually, here we just um, put, uh, put the all all things. So, fit forward neural network just consists of hundred neurons. Okay, and LST models. Uh, actually, uh, LST models take uh, two hundred uh, hidden units. And LSTM lasers also 200 units. And reservoir computers size is 400. OK. This is the size of the network, network node. So uh, this is for uh, prediction of linear type system, uh, prediction of experiments of linear type systems. It differ, we also take another value for uh, real world data sets. Okay, this is just differ. So can I switch to and also the GPUs and slides? Are... Yes, please proceed. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is uh, two works uh, based on my uh, published paper. So one one just covers that how how ex which nonlinear process just responsible for originating experiments, and another just covers uh, covers the prediction of extreme events using machine learning approach. So I just show another, um, another my ongoing work, um, which is based on extreme precipitation events in Arctic. So we uh, take three stations of uh, Svalbard region in Arctic and where extreme events just captured using block maxima method. Okay, so uh, block maxima method is the method, a method where uh, we captured extreme values or extreme events from real, real data sets. So here we take a block as a month and we take the maximum value of precipitation within a month and we take it as extreme precipitation events. And uh, this is uh, the real, real data sets of uh, three stations. And, and the lower panel depicts the extreme events as per block maxima. And we also show that uh, this is the probability dist distribution of X probability density plot, and this is distribution plots of extreme precipitation events, and which is uh, fitted by generalized extreme value distribution. Uh, actually, our motivation is that is any exogenous variable effects uh, for extreme precipitations. So we know that uh, due to due to the global warming, uh, air temperature just increases, and due to this, uh, we also observe extreme precipitation events in different areas of Arctic. So we try to observe that which exogenous variable is responsible for increment of this amount of precipitation in a particular this aspects of these three stations. And uh, the other uh, different approach uh, for this. So we can make the models as time dependent. And if we, uh, and uh, this is the generalized extreme value uh, distribution where mu, sigma, and xi is three parameters. One is location, 
one is scale and one is shape, shape parameter. And if we if we convert to this location parameter as time dependent, so how it uh, can be done? If we take mu t as a naught plus a one x, x one is exogenous variable. So exogenous variable is that that variables which uh, which can responsible to increment of extreme precipitation events directly. Maybe this is air temperature. Maybe sea surface temperature, maybe dew point temperature, or humidity, or like that. So, so if so, there is several uh, there is approach uh, um, where we can observe the dependence of this exogenous variable. Also, this is few uh, problems which we deal um, now. Also, uh, for we can uh, forecast uh, extreme events with uh, different black box model, uh, ARIMA, ARIMA X, or neural network. Neural network is black box model, or different forecasting model, and ARIMA X, which is used for 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 using exogenous variable. But the problem is, what we face that the limitation of data points though it consists more than 10000 data points but when we take extreme events it turns to only 500 data points for this the black box models um, definitely fails here actually we uh, i did not uh, show the result here i do not show the result here because the result is not so good. So since the data points is small, small, that's why we face different problem. The forecasting results is not so good. So at this moment, we just familiar with some, some com contemporary machine learning tools which is physics information learning. And it gives a insight that if we take small data and some physics, then we can forecast. So then in our mind, we just thought that we know two approach. One is extreme events from dynamical system approach, which I show here. And another one is, of course, that black box model. So if we take this differential equation as a, as a knowledge, then what happened? So we take real world data sets for forecasting and, and this dynamical system as a knowledge. Which, which can be fitted uh, for training the machine, then we thought that it, it can be improved, the results. So we just switch to another uh, our ongoing work where we mixed up. So we take the, we take the differential equation. This is as a physics based knowledge and and again we take uh, some real world data sets but before this we we just uh, show the the schematic diagram and what what to do just i told here because um, since this is just with uh, preliminary stage so i cannot show any results, but we just show the structure. So this is the differential equation uh, I I showed um, in previous slides, and and if we, we if we solve, then we we get x t. Okay, uh, by any uh, any methods 
like runge putta or euler's method we, if we solve it solve it we we just get xt it, also we get dx dt and d2x dt using using this numerical calculation and we we take it as input we take it as input and we just and this is the output that that is one step ahead prediction against t plus 1 one step ahead prediction and actually we this is our output and and here uh, we this is our regular regularization uh, and physics based loss function and this is the um, for the label data this is a uh, loss and this is um, mean square loss this is not mean square and uh, this is from from the dynamics and uh, this is our loss we calculate this and we also use a transfer learning and when the the network is feeded successfully and uh, uh, weight and uh, bias is uh, just tuned then we we just now we feed with any uh, real life extreme event data sets uh, actually uh, maybe here extreme event data sets or data sets which consists of extreme events and also also we calculate that physics physics based loss function as well as uh, data data based loss function and again we we just find out the x this is one step again one step ahead prediction and this is a just a schematic diagram or a just physics based approach or architecture uh, which i want which we want to predict extreme events data sets so this is some ongoing work so i uh, finish my talk with a proposal so actually this work um, i thought but i cannot do it because few few problem so first i just uh, propose the problem okay or design the problem so again when we just uh, studied about that 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 this work so we observed that due to the climate change it's directly affects also in our ecosystem or biodiversity so if temperature occurs uh, sorry temperature increases due to global warming and uh, for this uh, for this we we face different um, different results for this as well as we also observe that it also increases the sea surface temperature or increment the sea level sea water level and it just directly affect the species population so this is our design that if uh, temperature increases or or say sea surface again we just uh, a, another uh, exogenous variable like sea surface temperature increases so population just decreases so we just uh, show an example so due to ice melting of antarctica that emperor penguin or adult penguins are just um, decreases so so my exact problem is if we find out uh, sorry can i fi find out the time when the species just extinct so say uh, the population ex uh, population just decreases and if if in this study start this is the time and here the threatened population just below a 
certain certain uh, population say 100 so can i predict this time so this is a completely uh, schematic diagram and this is just uh, i just plot a linear trend and um, just just schematic diagram just but my problem is using this temperature or sea surface temperature or other other variable using this data, real world data sets i can just want to predict the when the population just uh, extinct or uh, this is the time uh, can i predict or forecast so this is my problem uh, and this problem can be done again in machine learning and just uh, what i thought uh, but the problem is the data the population data is so small and i don't know, I don't know. thank you thank you um, since you don't have results for this, maybe we can skip it. I go, can you go to, see, to your summary? Okay, okay. We don't talk about proposals here because uh, we can take forever. Okay, okay. So um, my summary is um, just uh, nothing but that the actually uh, physics-based machine learning approach uh, just successful in our uh, contemporary uh, problems so we just uh, just uh, design the any just uh, physics based uh, approach for uh, forecasting extreme extreme events uh, if we try then i think it will be helpful for our scientific community so that's my conclusion Thank you, Arno. We have questions for him. Thanks for tuning in today, and uh, we'll move on to our next talk. So yeah, our talk is by Haley. Uh, he would be leaving our uh, crunch group soon, and uh, we'll hear his last thoughts and last experiments. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandata, for the introduction. And also, I want to thank George for giving me this opportunity to give a very uh, short summary of my uh, my life in the crunch. So, uh, first, I want to invite everyone to open the history book of the crunch group and look at the, the postdoc with the, the longest tenure tenure in the crunch group uh, in the crunch group. So first, uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Shu Jin Li, who uh, who uh, worked here from uh, 2012 to 2018. Though so he spent like uh, five years and and nine months. And then there's another Li in, from the Li's family, uh, Jen Li. So basically, he worked here from uh, 2013 to 2019. That has uh, six years and uh, six months. Heli, you can say also where they are now, so people know. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Dr. Xie Jinli got a faculty position at the Zhejiang University in China, and Jin Li got the position at the Clemson University in North Carolina. And next one is basically is myself. Basically, I started in uh, 2015 in January, and uh, so I'm finished that uh, this year. Uh, July. So basically, I have like, I spent like seven years and seven months here. So I before before I dig into the literature like yesterday I, I assume that I'm the like I'm holding the record current record for the lo longest uh, crunch career but uh, after I dig into the literature I actually find there's another giant that actually <laughs> create this uh, untouchable record so this is Liu uh, who was a, a former uh, crunch member uh, he did his PhD here master PhD and also uh, I think a postdoc here. So he, he spent 11 years. I think the reason for that, I'm not sure. Maybe I, I, I will check with George, but uh, I overheard that uh, actually, actually Liu joined this group as a medical assistant, but George transferred him to a like, supercomputing master. So I think that transition may take some time. So that's the reason. But uh, he, considering he is uh, also a PhD student, so I'm still holding the record for the, for the postdoc. And also I want to just show where uh, my story start. 
So this story, actually my story started at this uh, address, this 37 uh, Manning Street, which does not exist anymore. So if you, for the first time, actually, I went to the crunch group, I go through this, this route. So if you can see that, it seems I'm approaching to a very modern uh, research facility, but then I realized that it's not the crunch group. This is the crunch group. It's actually a, a, residential, a residential house. And uh, so I was a little bit surprised, but uh, then we can also can view this house from, uh, from another side. And this picture actually can provide us more information. For example, uh, whenever uh, we arrive at this building and we see this car, it's parking there, then we know that uh, we are late actually for <laughs> late for the work. Because this is a George's car, it usually appear in front of the building like 9 a.m. sharp. So that's uh, the message we can get from this uh, this uh, picture. And actually I tried to dig out some uh, like pictures from inside the building, but there's uh, a very, I didn't find a lot. So there's, I only find one actually adopted from uh, Dr. Xu Yang's uh, Facebook. This is the picture when he actually defend his thesis along with uh, Dr. Yu Yu. I think the most of our crunch members know her. So both of them have, have become a very uh, successful uh, researchers. George, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, George just announced that uh, Xu Yang just uh, got the NSF uh, career award that basically secured his uh, tenure and uh, Dr. Yu Yu got uh, her tenure like a long time ago. So this is uh, the, the story at this uh, 37 uh, Manning Street. And then in 2016, so we, the current group moved the uh, location. I think this is the farewell picture took to, before we moved to this uh, 170 Hope Street. I think George already showed this uh, picture and there are many uh, old uh, senior members, which I missed a lot because in this picture, I was uh, just like, I was a rookie. So that's, this, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, this is my rookie year, so I'm still young. And most of the people are more senior than me. And then we moved to this uh, 170 Hope Street. And this is the first picture I think was taken in this building when we move in. And this was taken by the university and they want to show that uh, we have a more advanced the modern facility. And actually we are not actually discussing anything just pretend that uh, we, are, we are in a, a heated discussion. So the university want to just show this a picture. And actually I want to summarize some of my uh, achievements that uh, I'm very proud of during this uh, last uh, seven years. So first uh, I, I initial, uh, initiated and also I was the host of this uh, Crunch online seminar. So right now it has developed to be uh, one of the most popular uh, machine learning seminars and we have usually two talks every week and we can actually uh, learn from the latest uh, development of uh, machine learning technique. And actually also I have been hosting this uh, crunch lunch. So which I consider is the most uh, historical research group lunch. And it's featured with uh, diverse food like Chinese, uh, Italian, Indian, Mexican, and Persian recently. And this is the crunch lunch has a, I think it has a very long history and uh, actually it already started since I joined the, the group. And also I, the host uh, currently is the, the, the DPD online uh, nightclub meeting. So we consider this is the safest uh, nightclub meeting in the United States. Considering right now there are a lot of uh, gunshots and uh, physical <laughs> altercations. So, so basically we usually, usually stay late until midnight and everyone feels safe and there's no uh, physical altercation or verbal altercations, everyone was, uh, it's peaceful, <laughs> and also. Kelly, this is your this is your best line so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In this study comedy. <laughs> yeah. Also, I I host this uh, before the pandemic. We actually have this uh, offline uh, crunch seminar, so we have this face to face uh, presentation, and uh, I, I also host this uh, meta learning competition. I think George mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago. I, actually, we invite our group member to fight with the AI and for this $200 barbecue water. So with this 
strong motivation, we show that uh, a human being can really beat the machine in tuning the uh, parameters for the machine learning network. And also, uh, in addition to those uh, sad uh, achievements, I also suffer some uh, setbacks. For example, everyone knows that uh, in our group, we have, we have this uh, physics informed neural networks and deep net are, more, are two most uh, popular uh, tools that are uh, developed in our group. So, but uh, unfortunately I, was, I wasn't able to uh, like work on, uh, independently on either one of these uh, topics. So, but, but I actually witnessed the development of these two uh, tools. So I want to share with you some of the, my uh, experience on this development of these very two powerful tools. And hopefully uh, the current member and the new members can learn some uh, something from this. So first, uh, actually the PN was initiated around like end of like 2016. I think when the Madhir joined the group, we were already in this uh, 170 Hope Street, I think, after Madhir joined, he immediately, I don't know, uh, somehow just uh, started to collaborate with the Paris, which is also the co-author uh, co of this uh, uh, physics in first physics informed neural network paper. So actually, we can see that I remember that we we saw them like work day and night. They are like they are show they show up in the morning and discuss, and they, sometimes they write things on the board, and sometimes they are watching the monitor, discuss some papers. And also at night, they are still doing the same thing. And they are talking and they are discussing. So they are like, a, so even we suspect that, that they were actually developing a kind of a relationship. But the later on, then we realized that uh, they were actually uh, building the, the foundation for the very first uh, uh, pin paper that shifted the, the paradigm of this scientific machine learning it has a large impact even uh, until right now. So, and so if I knew they are doing this uh, significant thing, so I should uh, actually have bought them some uh, Subway sandwiches and get involved in the discussion. So hope maybe I can be one of the co-authors. And since after the pin, actually, then is the deep net. So deep net, everyone knows that uh, Lulu uh, developed, it's the first author of this deep net paper. And actually Lulu joined the group at the same time as I did and we, at the beginning, we work uh, very closely together on this particle uh, simulation. And uh, we uh, work uh, on several papers. We even uh, co-author the weekly report. So, <laughs> so but uh, there was one time that after we submitted this uh, co-authored weekly report, George said, okay, if you keep submitting a co-authored weekly report, I will give you only one personnel's salary to two of you. <laughs> and after that, Basically, Lulu just deviated from this park simulation and started working on the machine learning and he started to build this deep net. Also, first he developed this DeepXD package and then the deep net. And also during that time, I noticed that Lulu worked very hard. I, I see him working in the morning and also until midnight. He didn't go back to his apartment until midnight. So from these two experiences, I can see that in order to achieve this uh, this big success, I think we really need to uh, work very hard. Like George always said, be proactive. I think the, the thing, the reason that I missed this uh, two uh, breakthrough development is is also uh, I'm kind of a uh, lack a little bit of this uh, proactivity. So, so I hope that uh, the current member can learn from my uh, setbacks and, uh, and uh, I think uh, make bigger uh, achievement. And I think for the proactivity, I spend a lot of time to understand it. Uh, because I think uh, you, you always hear uh, George said to be proactive, but uh, what does it mean by uh, proactive? So after these years, I, I kind of start to learn that uh, proactive to us means that first we need to like kind of finish the, the project we are assigned to, which kind of pay for the bill of our salary. Then after that, we need to explore new things and uh, collaborate with our club, uh, group members. Since we have so many uh, talented group members, so the opportunities are there, just right around the corner could be. And also George constantly uh, bring us new ideas and keep us in the fashion. So I think there are many, uh, many opportunities here. So, I, so what we need to do is to uh, work a little bit harder 
and I think good things is going to happen. And then I just uh, uh, put on some snapshots of the in the seven years span. And uh, for for example, here we before the pandemic, actually we have a very uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, interesting activities. For example, every year we spend some uh, time at this. Uh, this uh, state park to have this group barbecue, and we have this uh, weekly uh, basketball uh, uh, match. And also, we used to go to this very uh, popular hot pot uh, at this uh, the at this uh, Italian town. Yeah, it's the Lamy hot pot. And also, we we hold this uh, secret Friday night uh, gathering. And also more recently, we have this uh, celebration for George to get uh, elected as this uh, uh, a member. And also we have some uh, also go through a farewell moment. We see a uh, new uh, members coming and, and old members uh, left. For example, this is uh, the earliest uh, farewell party I experienced in the 2016. Like we have these four members uh, uh, left the group and right now, uh, all of them become uh, faculty members, uh, either in China, and uh, yeah, either in China or United States. I think you can recognize that Mengjia is here, although he's uh, she was actually slimmer, than her, but yeah. And also, this is a picture from the Anso's uh, defense. So you can see that uh, George was was not very happy with, with Anso's uh, dissertation, but uh, I don't know why this Amel and Hafan were pretty happy there. And also in 2019, we uh, we sent out uh, two of senior members, uh, Zhen Li and Xue Jin. And during the pandemic, uh, and the Chairman Mao, this is our Chairman Mao and Ji Cheng left. And more recently, we have these two very talented machine learning guys, uh, Xu Hui and Shen Zhe, uh, went back. Although the farewell moment were kind of sad, but uh, after experiencing all these uh, farewell parties, I learned that. Uh, Although we may uh, physically apart, but uh, I think the connection, the friendship, and the collaboration can last uh, very long. And at the last, I want to just thank uh, George. Actually, I want to thank two George. So the first George is my uh, PhD advisor, uh, Professor George Lekotrafidis. He actually was very brief. He opened the door for me, let an uh, air conditioning engineer to do uh, molecular dynamics on the right cell membrane, which is totally a irrelevant topic from my background. And also he introduced to me, introduced me to the, our, our judge, Professor Kanyardakis. And the Professor Kanyardakis just took me to the elevator and they just raised me to a level that I definitely cannot get here by myself. So help me to make connections with the, the top scientists, the researchers, the clinicians in the world. I really learned a lot from uh, collaborating with those people and learned a lot from uh, working with George. And also I want to thank the former and the current uh, Crunch members for giving me this uh, wonderful seven years. So since there are so many, I have known so many members, I just cannot uh, write down all the names because <laughs> it's just too many. So actually I, we have a like WeChat group that uh, I, and we have this uh, all the we have a re, uh, registered all these uh, uh, Chinese uh, researchers and group members and visiting scholars in this WeChat group, and we also have this uh, Crunch group, uh, Google group. So I think those are very uh, important connections for researcher, and also it's uh, I think it's a, it's a privilege to be a group member, a Crunch member, to be able to know all this. Uh, very talented researchers. So I want to thank everyone for again giving me this uh, wonderful time, and I give uh, also also the best wishes to all the current Crunch members and the former members. Wish them have a successful career and a wonderful uh, personal life. And thank you very much. That's all for my talk. So, is there any uh, questions? I actually I can take some questions. I think there's still some time left. Okay, no more questions. <laughs> okay, I think we can proceed for the next talk. Uh, Heli, thank you very much for uh, bringing us down memory lane. And, uh, I, you know, you're catching up now because you're making all these uh, 
collaboration sa uh, yeah. with all the machine learning people so you will do well you didn't tell everybody where you are going to oh okay <laughs> Yeah, actually, I'm, uh, I was talking to George. I was very lucky with the name George because my PhD advisor is George and uh, my postdoc supervisor is also George. And the, the university that hired me gave me this position is also with part of this George. It's the University of Georgia. Yeah. So, so kind of I'm lucky, lucky with the name. I, <laughs> I can <laughs> I'll keep hanging out with all the George. So keep the luck going on. So, also, also, I think uh, our missing second speaker is here. So I think I just did a good job to cover the, the, the time. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. Great, yeah. great to have you, and I'll talk to you in person. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Eli. So we'll move into our uh, next speaker. Okay. Hi, Jesse. Hello. Uh, you may want to share your screen and I'll introduce you to our audience. Absolutely. Okay, so our next talk is by uh, Professor Jesse Chan. He would be talking to us about constructing robust high order entropy stable discontinuous Galerkin methods. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Computational and Applied Mathematics at Rice University. He received his PhD in Computation and Applied Mathematics from the University of Texas, Austin in 2013. And he served as a Pfizer postdoctoral instructor at Rice University from 2013 to 2015. And as a postdoctoral researcher at Virginia Tech from 2015 to 2016. And his research concerns the accurate and efficient numerical solutions of time-dependent partial differential equations. And his recent work has focused on the construction and uh, an efficient implementation of probably the stable higher order methods of wave propagation and compressible fluid flows. With that, we would want to uh, listen from you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I first of all want to thank uh, Kemraj, Samdada, Zongren, and especially Professor Karne Dacus for inviting me to speak in the seminar. Uh, I really appreciate it. Much of my work has stemmed from the work that was built upon this group at Brown. Uh, not as much the ML work as folks will see. I don't do as much, I don't do much machine learning myself, uh, but I hope to describe a little bit of the, uh, the numerical methods that we've constructed over the, over the years. So thank you for the chance to speak in the CRUNCH seminar. And with that, let me also acknowledge some the many folks who have helped me do this work. You may recognize one of them. I believe uh, Daniel is here in this uh, in this seminar as well. But without their help, I wouldn't be able to produce the results that I have in this talk. So this talk will mostly. Yeah, see, Tim Tim Warbarton was one oh, of my first students. <laughs> of course, how did I forget? Right, of course, <laughs> one of your original uh, PhD students in uh, in in, uh, in the nineties. Yes, of course. The 90s, yeah. Thank you. So the entire uh, this entire column then is alumni of the Crunch Group, and we are in some sense uh, distant uh, academic relatives. So in my talk, uh, I'm going to focus on work that essentially was done by this first row and the second row in collaboration with me. These these will be two different ways of constructing what I call robust entropy stable methods, methods that you can prove are stable in certain specific mathematical senses, um, and. Let me try and give some motivation. So I work mainly in these forward problems in uh, direct numerical methods for uh, problems in hyperbolic PDEs. I have mostly gravitated towards aerodynamic applications in the last couple of years. Uh, in particular, I like looking at complex flow type problems over interesting geometries. So for example, if you have a trifoil right here and you want to see how flow uh, goes over it, you might want to capture things like these vortexes shedding off the back, and you might want to capture the propagation accurately without adding too much numerical dissipation or, uh, or adding too much dispersion. And so for these, uh, for applications like these, I tend to gravitate towards high order accurate methods to give that give me high accuracy on unstructured complex meshes like these. And if I put these two together, then I usually end up working either in high order finite element methods or in discontinuous Galerkin methods. I work mainly in DG because uh, as George, uh, Professor Carney Docs mentioned, my postdoc advisor was Tim Warburton and he got me into the DG world. So DG is nice in my opinion because it works very nicely on unstructured meshes and makes it very straightforward to get high order accuracy. And in terms of my own research, I've mostly found uh, DG to be extremely useful in the context of explicit time stepping. 
So if I'm trying to solve a system of ordinary differential equations that results from discretizing a partial differential equation and turning it into a system of ODEs, then usually you have to invert what's called the mass matrix over a, a finite element system. If you use classical high order continuous finite elements, this mass matrix is uh, sparse, but fully coupled and therefore it's inverse is dense. Whereas if you use high order DG methods, you get this nice block diagonal structure, which makes explicit time stepping remarkably easy with high order discontinuous Galerkin methods. So let me start getting into some of the uh, boilerplate, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, propaganda about high order methods. Why do we, why am I interested in these? I'm interested in the propagation of waves and vortices. And to do this accurately, I would like methods that have very low numerical dissipa uh, dissipation or dispersion. Basically methods that don't introduce a lot of artificial physics into my simulation as I run things. This is an example of what I mean by artificial physics. If I take a simple Gaussian profile here and I just advect it around, basically push it using the advection equation in a periodic domain, and I run this around 10 times, then after the 10th uh, revolution around this domain, a first order accurate method will dissipate away almost all the solution. You get nearly a constant at the end. A second order method here does much better. You can see you recover more features, but you can still see a lot of artificial dissipation that gets put into the method. A fourth order method does much better. And an eighth order method, you can see there's really no difference between the exact solution in blue and the numerical solution. What's also nice is that you might notice that as I increase the order of approximation of these methods, I actually decrease the number of grid points. So I have fewer and fewer elements. I keep the number of degrees of freedom the same. And so the resolution power that I get from a high order method is higher per degree of freedom compared with a low order method. And this is a very academic problem, but it's not too hard to imagine that it carries over to a physical problem in much the same way. This is only one of many specific examples. This is from Beck and Gassner in 2013, where they run uh, the Taylor Green vortex, a model of, uh, of turbulence, a, a turbulence like problem in a box. And if you run things with a second order method, you can see you dissipate away a lot of the solution features. A fourth order method looks better. And when you run a 16th order me method, you can see all the contours, the ISO contours of the Q criterion, which are plotted here, they look really well resolved, really clean. And so this is really nice because these high order methods show how effective they can be for problems which are sensitive to numerical dissipation. This is the boilerplate, this is the uh, propaganda. I should also probably describe why high order methods haven't been widely adopted by every single person in the community. So I discovered this when I first tried to run high order methods on nonlinear conservation laws and fluid flow that they can blow up fairly easily. This is the Berger's equation where I start with a sinusoidal initial condition. And the nice thing about Berger's equation is it demonstrates one of the key features of nonlinear conservation laws. If you run things over a certain amount of time, you can form a shock discontinuity in the solution. And if I run an eighth order, a very high order DG method on the same uh, problem, then because I can't perfectly resolve the shock if, uh, if it's within an element, then I get these oscillations. And if I keep running the solution, then these oscillations, they hover around, but eventually they blow up. My solution then goes to, uh, it crashes and I'm unable to run my simulation any further. And all the work I put into the simulation up to this point is all useless. So this doesn't just happen for shocks. It also happens for under-resolved solution features like turbulence or even under-resolved reticular type flows. And this makes it really difficult to apply high order DG methods to a lot of problems in aerodynamics because you almost always have under-resolved features. So that led me to what I'd like to talk about today, entropy stable high order schemes. And the main idea behind them is to build in some type of stability guarantee into your numerical method without actually decreasing the, uh, the accuracy of the method, the inherent accuracy of the method. So if I look at a high order DG method, and this is from the, uh, the book of my postdoc advisor and Jan Hesthaven, uh, they argue that if you're working on a nonlinear problem using a high order DG method, you might need to apply some stabilization, some filtering, either spectral vanishing viscosity coming from this group or something just like a modal filter. Uh, so you need this heuristic stabilization, but if you apply too much, you can lose a lot of accuracy because the stabilization usually ends up adding dissipation. And their advice was to filter as little as possible, but as much as is needed. And this makes sense intuitively, but finding that exact amount of dissipation, the amount of uh, stabilization to add can be very tricky. It changes with the mesh, with the type of solution, with the problem setup, uh, even with the polynomial degree. 
So what I started working on were these entropy stable schemes, which they claim to improve robustness without adding extra dissipation. I'd like to try and show you how. It doesn't make these DG methods automatically bulletproof. You can, of course, still crash them if you have negative density or pressure. We'll talk about that later. But it turns them into what I think is a very good numerical method, equivalent to like a higher order Wino scheme in terms of stability and robustness. And I am, of course, not the only person who works in uh, these methods. There is a vast literature of folks who have developed them for finite volumes, uh, high order spectral element methods, and then uh, high order DG on triangular grids. And I'm going to borrow a lot of their work. So just to give you an idea of what actually happens when I run these simulations using an entropy stable method. These are three different simulations from three different research groups. Uh, up here is from a, a group of folks in Cologne. Down here, this is a group of folks associated with NASA and KAUST. Uh, and up here is, uh, some are some results that I produce and that I'll talk about a little bit later from my group. All of us are using entropy stable high order DG methods of order three or above. None of us are using any artificial viscosity, filtering, or slope limiting. These are all just plain out of the box methods. And we can run something like the magnetohydrodynamic or Zag Tang vortex in 3D. We can run uh, supersonic flow at Reynolds number 10,000 over a cylinder with shocks and uh, some nice vortical propagation at the end. And we can run this long time, nearly turbulent or 2D turbulent Kelvin Helmholtz instability. All of these have very highly under resolved features. And none of them blow up because this entropy, these entropy stable methods, they seem to provide enough inherent stability to make things work. So let me try and outline where I'll go in the talk. I'm going to try and discuss very in very basic terms how I derive these, what, the, what I think the main contribution are is. And then I'll talk about two different ways of constructing very robust entropy stable methods. The first is by adding a positivity preserving limiter, which we hope is minimally dissipative. And the next one is by using a specific variant of these entropy stable schemes, which seems to have oddly enough, some additional uh, uh, stability properties that we can't exactly prove, but we observe numerically. So let me talk a little bit about entropy stable finite volumes and how to go from there to entropy stable nodal DG methods. We're going to primarily look at nonlinear conservation laws. We're going to look at problems of this form where you have some nonlinear flux, F of U, and that governs a uh, the evolution of the conservative variables U. So this includes Berger, shallow water. I'm going to mainly focus on compressible Euler and Navier Stokes. Entropy stability is stability with respect to a convex entropy function. And I'll call that S. You can think of this like uh, a variant of the thermodynamic entropy. So if I take this convex entropy function, then I can show that you have stability with respect to it in some sense that generalizes what's known as energy stability for these partial differential equations. And the way to uh, see this mathematically is if you take this entropy function, it's a function of the conservative variables, you can differentiate them with respect to the conservative variables to get a vector of new variables, which we call the entropy variables V. And these entropy variables, you can map back and forth between the conservative and entropy variables as long as this entropy function is convex, strictly convex. And these entropy variables basically act as the variables which extract out the entropy inequality from the equation. You can multiply the equation by these entropy variables, integrate over the domain, do a little bit of calculation, and you end up with basically a statement that says the average rate of change of entropy in the entire domain, plus what is essentially the entropy flux in and out of the boundary, that has to decrease. So if you're on a periodic or closed domain, then basically the entropy in the domain, the average rate of change of entropy in the domain is negative. Entropy decreases. So how exactly does this tie into numerical methods? You have this stability property at the continuous PDE level, but you can also build this into a numerical scheme. And this has been known since very early on, since the 1980s and earlier. Uh, if I take a very simple finite volume scheme and what I'm just going to assume is that I have a 1D problem and I break my domain up into cells and I try and discretize the finite volume uh, by the finite volume method to solve for the cell average on each of these cells. If I solve the integrated form of this uh, equation, then I end up with a system of ODEs that looks like the following. The evolution of the cell average on a cell plus the flux in, uh, the flux in and out of the boundary divided by the cell size, that all should balance. So this is a very basic finite volume scheme that you might see in an undergrad uh, numerical methods class. And what's interesting about the entropy conservative finite volume schemes that I study uh, is that if you take this flux, this, this is a flux which involves a solution on uh, both sides of an interface. So if I have a finite volume scheme and I have two uh, solutions, then you can see there's discontinuity in the middle. And 
Therefore, evaluating the flux at this discontinuity is impossible unless you can somehow reconcile the left and right discontinuous solutions. This is done through an averaging procedure by introducing this numerical flux. And if you have certain properties in this numerical flux, this implies certain properties of your scheme. So for example, we have consistency, we have symmetry. These imply accuracy and conservation of your finite volume numerical scheme and are common to most finite volume methods. But we also include this extra entropy conservation property. And what it basically does is relates the dot product of the jump in the entropy variables to the uh, numerical flux in terms of the conservative variables. And their relationship is cast in terms of what's known as the entropy potential. This is just a term which shows up in the entropy balance. And I'm not going to go too much into detail in it. But if we take this, and if we combine this with, say, a periodic discretization, you can show that we get a numerical, uh, a discrete equivalent of this entropy conservation uh, property, that the average rate of change of entropy uh, remains zero, at least its quadrature-based approximation does. And if we add a dissipation term, which is entropy dissipative, then we get a dissipation of entropy in our numerical scheme. So what I would like to do now is describe how to essentially move from these finite volume schemes into high order nodal entropy stable DG methods. And I do so usually by talking about Hadamard products because it provides a nice little bridge from finite volume schemes to more general discretizations. The Hadamard product is just the entry wise product between two matrices. It's what you would have thought matrix multiplication might have been in high school or in middle school before you learned linear algebra. And the reason why I introduce this is because you can take a system of equations. Uh, let's say we have n different points then you can think of the evolution of a finite volume scheme as being governed by uh, the evolution of this vector plus this flux right-hand side here. These are the differences in the fluxes divided by H. So what I will do is first of all, I'll just multiply H to the other side, and then I'll replace all these fluxes with entries of a flux matrix. I'll associate the fluxes between every single cell. So not just between neighboring cells, but between every single cell in the mesh. I will compute the numerical flux between those solutions. So uh, this is now a global matrix. And if I look uh, at the difference between adjacent entries of this matrix, then I get back this finite volume scheme. This is just an algebraic rewriting for now. And the reason I do so is because if I now cast things in terms of this flux matrix, I can introduce the Hadamard product and say that this difference in fluxes is equivalent to the Hadamard product of this flux matrix with another matrix. And if you stare at this matrix, if you look at one of these rows, it suddenly looks a little bit familiar. This is nothing more than a periodic central difference matrix scaled by H, uh, or sorry, 2H. So you can recast a finite volume scheme in terms of the Hadamard product of two matrices multiplied by one, and this sums up the, uh, the contribution of these matrices over each individual row. So you take the Hadamard product of these two matrices, sum up each row over all the columns, and that recovers exactly this finite volume formulation. But what's really nice about this is, apart from the fact that you get this very compact representation in terms of Hadamard product matrices at the very end, you can actually generalize this. So I'm rewriting my entropy conservative finite volume schemes now in this semi-discrete formulation where I've introduced a mass matrix, which is just H times the identity for finite volumes. I've introduced this differentiation matrix Q and I've introduced this flux matrix F. And it turns out that the key result is that you can generalize this far beyond finite volumes for any matrix Q, which is skew symmetric and conservative. So Q times one is equal to zero. You actually get entropy conservation. And you can similarly generalize the entropy dissipation properties of an entropy dissipative finite volume scheme as well. So automatically what this means, if you have a periodic central finite difference scheme, you can plug in that Q matrix and recover an entropy conservative finite difference scheme. If you have a spectral method, then you have a skew symmetric spectral difference, uh, uh, spectral difference matrix that gives you an entropy conservative spectral difference scheme. And uh, Jesse, I have a question. Yes. Do I, still, do I uh, if if I do things right and put, let's say, for the final, the the, uh, the state variables at the mid of the cell and so on, do I still have the energy conservation in addition? To add, or or the can, or there's a conflict between the two. Ah, great question. So do you mean like conservation of say uh, of the conserved quantities like mass? Yeah. Momentum? Yeah. 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 Yes. Absolutely. So you get global conservation in those cases. I don't believe uh, in finite volumes, you can recover local conservation, but the proof is a little bit more complicated. It just involves more algebraic properties. But yes, you do get you do recover conservation due to properties of the entropy conservative flux, too. Thank you. Okay. Can I make an observation here? also, Please. Jesse? Yeah. Uh, so this matrix Q is the co-boundary operator. 
is another way to interpret it. So like the this is like the graph gradient. Um, ah, also ah. The, so I'm curious, which is the thing that makes sense for a H div type problem, like a conservation law. There's also um, higher order co-boundary operators like the graph curl, for example, which would be relevant for H curl. And, and so I'm wondering, each one of these operators have these properties you have written on the bottom, skew symmetry and conservation. So I'm wondering whether, you know, maybe it's just, maybe we can follow up and talk about it some more, but um, I wonder if you could do this kind of thing for Maxwell as well, right? Because if these are the relevant ingredients, right, that you could replace Q with these higher order things. So I think that may be possible, but uh, at least our experience with, say, magnetic hydrodynamics, if you merge Maxwell with compressible Navier Stokes, uh, there are some technical details associated with which make it difficult to use, say, H div or H curl conforming type discretizations. Uh, we usually just use these scalar H1 type discretizations for each individual variable and don't treat things like a vector velocity or vector uh, magnetic potential or uh, magnetic field separately. I can explain a little bit more about why that's the case later on. Uh, let, let, let's talk offline. I, I think that MHD is less, you know, it would be more for Maxwell. Sure. That it would make that that's H curl conforming and, and so on. Right. Then there may be something there. Yeah, I'd be I would love to talk afterwards. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I did promise that I would talk about nodal DG methods, and I want to try and explain how that fits into this framework. So if I look at nodal DG methods, I can produce a Q matrix relatively easily. I can do what, uh, well, what Professor Carniadakis' group has done since the early 90s. Uh, I can write down a collocation type discretization. I can specify that I have these nodal points and I'm going to place them at gauss lobato points. I'll represent my polynomial in this basis using a Lagrange basis. And then I can define a nodal differentiation matrix Q by simply taking the Galerkin type weak formulation associated with this basis. I just take the derivative of these basis functions, multiply them by the basis functions themselves, integrate over the domain, and that gives you a Q matrix. It turns out that this matrix is conservative. You can show Q times one is equal to zero. You can extend it to higher or uh, higher dimensions using a tensor product structure. Um, it's not exactly skew symmetric though, but what you do have is what's known as a summation by parts property using specifically gauss lobato quadrature. So if I introduce also the face extraction matrix that just picks out the endpoints, and I introduce this boundary matrix, which scales by the uh, direction of the normal at each of the boundary points, then I have that the uh, Q plus Q transpose is not equal to zero as it is for a skew symmetric matrix, but it's equal to this boundary operator. And if I use this, then I can uh, then combine this with a DG formulation. I can take my spectral element formulation here and then add this additional boundary term involving an interface flux and then a corrective term. And this formulation ends up being entropy conservative or entropy stable, depending on how your interface flux is defined as well. So with this, if you use an entropy stable numerical flux to compute uh, this matrix F and also this interface flux, then you end up getting a quadrature version of the local cell and en entropy inequality over every single individual element. And this also implies a global entropy inequality. So this was uh, work that's been done since 2014 by various different groups. And something I've been focused on recently has been, well, how do I extend this beyond just nodal DG methods? It's nice to be able to work with nodal collocation spectral element methods, but also, well, much of uh, the early work that came out of this group was uh, on hybrid meshes, on tetrahedral triangular meshes, prismatic meshes, on, on with pyramids, very complex objects for which these collocation schemes are not easy to define. And the answer is a little bit complex. I'll try and give the main high level overview, but essentially for a non-collocated method, if you have a modal DG method, this is a DG method where the uh, Lagrange points at which you define your solution and the quadrature points are not necessarily overlapping. They are not the same anymore. So what we have to do is take solution values at these blue points, let's say, and then we have to be able to transfer them to a separate quadrature grid, which I'm outlining in these red points over here. When you transfer the solution, usually you use high order polynomial interpolation, and it turns out that costs you entropy conservation in these cases. So what we use instead is a trick that's known as the entropy projection. This is a little bit complicated, but what we do is we take our, cons uh, our numerical solution for the conserved variables, and then we evaluate the entropy variables. These are now non-polynomial. So we project them back onto degree n polynomials and then reevaluate the conserved variables in terms of these projected entropy variables. And this gives us our tilde variables, which we refer to as the entropy projected conservative variables. 
We can use this to evaluate the uh, to extrapolate the solution to any single point on this grid that we like. We can do quadrature points. We can do face uh, boundary points. Uh, and if we do so, and if we combine this with some special boundary terms for high order accuracy, then we end up recovering an entropy conservative numerical scheme. And we can now extend things to what's known as staggered grid discretization or modal DG discretizations without any problem at all. The nice thing about, uh, I, let me just give you a quick illustration. If I have density, velocity, and pressure here, I'm just initializing them to some values on a mesh. I can then compute the entropy variables. These are non-polynomial. But when I compute their L2 projection, you can see I incur some approximation error. So there's an error in this step that we'll talk about. And then when I take these projected variables in red and transfer them back into the conservative variables, you can also see I incur some approximation error. So there's a downside to this, but we've noticed that this approximation error is also high order accurate. And so we seem to retain high order accuracy in the general modal case as well. And the reason why we're interested in this is because these modal formulations are really flexible and they've allowed us to work uh, in various areas that were a little more difficult to approach before using this summation by parts finite difference framework. We can do reduced order modeling now, non-conforming meshes are easy to treat. We've been able to focus on things like uh, the compressible Navier-Stokes equations with much more ease because these modal formulations can borrow from uh, the host of existing work that's been done before. Okay, so let me talk, uh, right, let me actually just uh, give you one illustration of this at work. This is some work that I've done with my student, Yimin Lin, and uh, another graduate of this group, uh, Tim Warburton. So we have this flow over a cylinder at Mach, uh, number 1.5, Reynolds number 10,000, no artificial viscosity or filtering or anything. This is just implemented on GPU and run. So we can see that you have a shock, you have these uh, trailing vortices, but nothing blows up. This runs stably for the entire course of the, uh, a simulation up to time t equals 100, and you seem to resolve things with high order accuracy as well. Okay, so I did tell you earlier on that things can still fail for these methods, and I want to uh, try and go through this to talk about positivity. So the problem with these entropy stable schemes is that these numerical fluxes, we have explicit formulas for them, but it turns out that they depend, weirdly enough, on the logarithm of density and temperature. So you can't evaluate a logarithm without those uh, quantities being positive. And so you require positivity of density and pressure for these entropy stable schemes to even, to even compute. And so we have to enforce these because this is not naturally uh, given by these entropy stable schemes. And as we, I think as uh, many groups have demonstrated over the years, it's really hard to enforce both, enforce both high order accuracy and positivity. So what we're going to do is try to relax those conditions. We're going to try to look for positivity while retaining subcell resolution. So these are again, Lobato nodes on a grid. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reinterpret them using uh, a finite volume subgrid where the, the size of these subgrid cells is exactly equal to the quadrature weights or the diagonal entries of a mass lump mass matrix for these Lobato nodes. So this allows me to view the same set of degrees of freedom as both a high order DG method and also as a low order non-uniform finite volume grid for which I can try to enforce something like positivity. So this is unfortunately restricted to just nodal methods but it makes them relatively robust. So we need to assume mass lumping and collocation. Our mass matrix will be diagonal and we'll have collocated methods. So there won't be any entropy projection and the quadrature points and the, uh, the, the interpolation points will all be the same. What we do is we're going to rewrite our entropy stable formulation using a, uh, a more general framework. So this is going to now be a global formulation where we just have one single DG matrix over the entire mesh. And we will basically use uh, forward Euler extending to high order using uh, SSP Runge-Kutta methods to write down our formulation in a fully discrete space time form. So this is our formulation. We have our diagonal mass matrix entry. We have the time derivative, and then we have the product of Q times some fluxes. So this is just a very basic scheme. And what we're going to do is to add an algebraic dissipation, uh, which is something that was uh, formulated by Dmitry Kuzmin in, uh, in Germany and also Germán Popov and Tomás in Texas A&M. And if we actually take a large enough dissipation coefficient Dij, it turns out that you can rewrite this formulation in terms of these so-called bar states. And if this Dij is large enough, it turns out that these bar states you can show are positive. This also comes from finite volume schemes. Uh, you can show positivity using numerical fluxes and different properties. But what's nice about this reformulation is we can show that the next solution, the uh, solution of the next time step is equal to a convex combination of the previous solution 
and these bar states. So if we retain positivity for the previous solution and for these uh, special bar intermediate states, then we get automatic positivity, provable positivity of our next solution under a CFL condition. So you have some relationship between these dissipation coefficients and DT, and also under some positivity constraints on these coefficients and the mass matrix. So let me try and uh, give the main idea uh, here. If we take this dissipation large enough, then you can prove these bar states are positive under specifically, this is the CFL condition. This was proven in this 2016 paper. I won't go into too much detail on it, uh, but it's using standard properties of uh, Riemann problems and stuff from uh, the book of Toro et al. And if uh, what we've done is we've extended this to the compressible Navier-Stokes equations to deal with viscous terms in a robust way as well. So what we do is we take our formulation from before and then we add in viscous fluxes. We just assume that we have some viscous uh, terms which are denoted by sigma. And these can come from any type of discretization, LDG. They can come from just a, uh, a primal type discretization of the viscous terms. But whatever we do, we're just going to add these into the fluxes. So we have the inviscid fluxes and the viscous fluxes here. And now we're going to try to control the positivity of both of these using the same exact artificial dissipation terms. So you get, again, viscous bar states here. And work from Zong actually in 2017, one of the uh, graduates of Brown University back in the day as well, proved that if you take this dissipation to be large enough related to uh, this complex uh, wave speed estimate involving beta, then you can again prove positivity of the density and the pressure under a viscous CFL condition. So this allows us to, uh, to extend uh, this framework directly to the viscous compressible navier stokes case as well to advection diffusion equations. So one detail that we overlooked at first was that when we add this artificial dissipation, it usually depends on the sparsity of the discretization matrices. So this is really an algebraic flux corrected transport type method. Uh, this dissipation here, you can see the coefficients depend on these wave speed estimates, but they also depend on this lambda max quantity, which I didn't really talk about. Essentially, this lambda max is an estimate of the inviscid wave speed for a hyperbolic problem. And this QIJ is just the entry of the Q of uh, our discretization matrix. If this is zero, then this whole thing goes to zero. So if you have a sparse uh, discretization matrix, then you have very sparse uh, dissipation added. But if you have a high order and dense matrix, then you see something like this. This is the advection equation. This is a problem that's uh, been done by Will Pasner. And what he did was he simply solved the advection equation using this artificial dissipation method. And what you can see is that as he increases the order from p equals three to p equals a whopping 31, you can see that the solution dissipates and you start getting this staircasing effect and the solution essentially dissipates to the point where it looks like a near constant. This is really bad for solution quality. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to contact our resident expert, Nathaniel Trask, uh, who came up with a very nice idea within the context of scalable mesh-free mimetic methods, which I understand was part of his work originating at Brown as well. And we're going to construct sparse operators or sparse matrices that we will use to construct these low order schemes. And this is going to be a lot of detail, but I'll try and uh, go over at least the main algorithmic process. So on a general, uh, on a general discretization for these nodal entropy stable DG methods, you simply have a bunch of points. And what we'll do is we'll try to construct an adjacency graph by just associating each point with a neighborhood around it. Usually we say this is roughly the uh, proportional to the size to the, the quadrature weight associated with it. So you get different sizes of neighborhoods. We can then say, well, this node is connected to these nodes. This node might be connected to these nodes. And we build an adjacency graph for the entire element. Using this adjacency graph, we can then enforce this summation by parts property. We can build the uh, enforcement of a skew symmetry into the entire matrix. Sorry, this should be wrong. This should be the skew symmetric part of Q is given to be this skew symmetric form. And then we can finally enforce a conservation property by solving a uh, essentially a graph Laplacian problem, which we know how to solve. It has Neumann boundary conditions. And we there are a lot of well-known methods to solve this very, very efficiently. We can just pre-compute it over one element and we use it for the entire mesh. So finally, our last step is to try and maintain as much higher order accuracy as possible. We have these very robust low order methods. We have a 
accurate but non-robust high order method and we'll just try and blend them using a convex combination to enforce a relaxed low order bound so that the density and the pressure are larger than some constant alpha multiplied by the density and pressure for this low order solution we recover it turns out a local entropy inequality if we do blending element wise and we automatically get local conservation as long as we use the same interface flux in both the high and low order methods so with that, I should probably show you that this actually works because a lot of this is dependent on basically implementation and details. So I want to show you that we at least get basic uh, sanity check type results. So we looked at the uh, LeBlanc and the uh, shock tube and the viscous shock tube for Euler and for Navier-Stokes. And what we can see is that as we refine, then we get first order convergence for the LeBlanc shock tube. This is expected because you have a shock, so you can't get more than first order convergence in the uh, L1 norm. I, well, I think it's hard to get uh, more than first order convergence in the L1 norm. Sometimes you get 1.5, we uh, seem to get one. If we look at the viscous shock tube, however, eventually as we refine far enough, we get to resolving the viscous shock. And you can see that as we refine the mesh, we recover a high order accurate rate, which is a little bit below the optimal rate of H to the P plus one. We also are running the shock at very high Mach numbers, Mach 20, in order to make sure that we actually activate the positivity preserving limiter. We can do the same thing for a very challenging isentropic vortex because we've set the minimum density to be 10 to negative three. And here we do get much better high order accurate rates. We get something more like H to the P plus one half, which you can prove for DG methods. Uh, it's a little bit better here, here, and here. And you can see this works for both quadrilateral and triangular meshes. We also can run realistic problems. These are simple toy problems at the moment because we're still running them on a small computer, but we can run the double mock reflection with just as positive preserving limiter and an entropy stable nodal DG method. If I have a relaxation parameter of 0.5, then it remains robust and you get this very nice resolution of these vortices while also retaining positivity of the entire problem. If you compare with the, these results from Pasner, where he uses a very similar technique but doesn't use an entropy stable scheme and also constrains this minimum specific entropy and enforces also a local minimum principle, this adds a lot more dissipation. And so he has roughly uh, around three times more uh, resolution than us, but we get similar solution feature resolution. Finally, we can run something uh, in the compressible Navi Stokes case. This is an under-resolved simulation of the Daru Tenod shock tube, where you have wall boundary conditions here. You have a shock which propagates, hits a reflective wall, and comes back, interacting with the shock and the boundary layer. And you produce all sorts of weird roll-up phenomena and this rolling uh, thing here, this broken shear layer here. It looks fancy. So there are we're still verifying the uh, physical uh, realism of this uh, quantity of these solutions. It's a little bit hard to actually get a fully resolved solution because you have some very, very uh, nasty boundary layer effects that I cannot resolve with an explicit time stepper. But we at least remain stable and we get qualitative agreement with other coarse uh, underresolved solutions for this problem uh, when we run our when we compare a solution to them. OK, Jesse, so I, uh, yes. in, that, in that picture. Uh, yes. I see above the Kelvin Helmholtz stability, which is, I see this is a high, is that high frequency? Are, are these uh, real or are they, because yes. they emanate from the, from the little vortices, right? They are, they are absolutely real. So we believe that what's odd is that these actually show up. So these vortices along, oh, sorry, I mean, these oscillations along the shock is what you're referring to, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, these are absolutely these are absolutely numerical. They are not physically real. And we've uh, noticed that they stem both from the imposition of the boundary condition and also the interaction of the shocks with each other. However, we believe that this is something that we've noticed that these go away a little bit as we refine the mesh, oddly enough. And this is true not just for our method. We see these oscillations, but the method of uh, Germond and Popov and, uh, and Matthias Meyer, they actually also see these oscillations if they run on a coarse enough under-resolved mesh. I, I'm not entirely sure. We, we haven't experimented yet with shock capturing or something to remove these oscillations, but I think that's also something you can do. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I'm running out of time, I see. So I'm going to try and uh, very brief, uh, briefly talk a little bit about how to construct robust entropy stable schemes in a different way. And this is going to talk a little bit about our Julia library, Trixie.jl. I briefly want to mention this because I know that there was some interest from certain uh, postdocs in this group about looking at this library. And what it is, is a highly optimized library for solving nonlinear conservation laws in Julia. Uh, Julia is nice and fast. What we've actually noticed is that there's a similar library called Fluxo that's written in Fortran. It does exactly the same thing as one of the solvers in Trixie. And 
Trixie is actually faster than Fluxo is, both for a standard DG method and also for an entropy conservative DG method. Fluxo is in blue, Trixie is in red, and this is the wall clock time as we increase the polynomial degree. It handles things like unstructured, uh, high order curved meshes, which are generated using one of David Kobriva's mesh generators. And it's also got this very nice, uh, it's very, very nice, uh, mesh adaptivity routine, which I just want to briefly highlight. Here's an example of mesh adaptivity dynamically in Trixie for a slightly fancier version of the flow over a cylinder uh, Euler problem. You can see that we dynamically refine to capture the shocks and the vortices which are coming off of the cylinder. And also it can deal with things like the, uh, the curved wavy walls that we've imposed in this uh, situation. So Trixie has a whole bunch of different solvers, and I've implemented also my modal entropy projection-based solvers inside Trixie, only for uniform meshes, but they still lead to some very interesting solutions. So here is an example of the kelman helmholtz instability. I'm running this for two different resolutions, a degree three, 64 by 64 mesh, a degree seven, 32 by 32 mesh. And you can see it's it's very sensitive to numerical discretization. This is somewhat well known in the, in the community that the kelvin helmholtz instability is really sensitive to your discretization resolution. So we're not going to be talking about accuracy or convergence in any realistic sense. We're just going to be using the problems that we study in this section as a test of robustness. So we can run the kelvin helmholtz instability to long times. This was t equals 10. We can run until t equals 100 even, and then I just got bored and stopped it. But it turns out that this is really unique to the entropy-stable DG method that uses entropy projection. In other words, these modal formulations. It turns out if you run a collocation or a spectral element discontinuous Galerkin method that's entropy stable, you see some big differences. So for the kelvin helmholtz instability, if I look at a 16 by 16 mesh or a 32 by 32 mesh, if I look at degrees one through seven, the collocation method always seems to crash. These are the times at which the simulation crashed and the entropy projection methods, they all seem to run until the final time. I can run them far, far, far beyond time t equals 15, but 15 is what we're going to go with for, uh, for the, uh, this comparison. It works on quadrilateral meshes. We see the same pattern on triangular meshes. And we see it also for other problems like the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, the Rickmeyer-Meshkov instability. Here are just the same tables. I'm going to rush through them because you can basically see the behavior uh, just outlined in red. Collocation crashes, entry projection doesn't. The Rickmeyer-Meshkov instability is a little bit less well known, but it's a uh, impulsively started shock where you run a shock through an, uh, a static interface, and that generates small scales uh, around here, which uh, I think compose of kelvin helmholtz instabilities themselves. And again, you can see the same behavior. Collocation, entropy-stable DG methods, they tend to crash. Entropy projection schemes tend to be really stable, which is odd. This doesn't mean that they're stable in all situations, but it means that for these specific types of problems, uh, ones with a lot of under-resolved particular features, entry projection methods seem to be more robust for some odd reason. So we dug a little deeper. One thing we have noticed is that this only shows up when you're looking at high Atwood number effects. So if you look at the Taylor Green vortex, for example, where you have constant density, there is no difference between entropy stable schemes. But as you start increasing the, uh, the contrast in the density. So you look at the jump between the density divided by the average over uh, discontinuous density with two states, that gives you the Atwood number. And increasing the Atwood number shows that these collocation schemes, they start to crash at much lower Atwood numbers than the entropy projection schemes. This is the crash time, the end time of the solver, and the entropy projection-based entropy stable schemes, they run until very high Atwood numbers, around 0.8 or 0.9, depending on your time step tolerance and your polynomial degree. There's a lot of differences between these two discretizations, though. Um, I just want to mention that we have done our, uh, our homework. We've tried to figure out whether or not the entry projection is really the cause of this. We've ruled out interface corrections, like basically different types of interface fluxes or quadrature accuracy as being cause of this. I'm going to skip over them for the sake of time right now. Um, and I'm just going to finish off by talking a little bit about why we should actually care about using these types of, uh, of schemes. So we did already talk about positively preserving limiters for nodal entropy stable schemes. So why would we care that a modal entropy stable scheme, which has left fewer theoretical guarantees, why would we care that it seems more robust for certain problems? And I just want to illustrate the difference in terms of resolution power for these sensitive uh, turbulent like vortical features uh, when you apply just very light shock capturing and when you apply no shock capturing at all. So we're going to use that same uh, subcell positively preserving limiting that we talked about before, and we're going to adapt it into an entropy-stable shock capturing scheme 
we're also going to use an advanced subcell convex limiting approach that uh, folks in Cologne, Germany have uh, pioneered, which is very similar to our positivity preserving scheme. So this is more of a standard, in, uh, a recent but fairly advanced uh, shock capturing scheme. And this, I would argue, is one of the more cutting edge shock capturing schemes at the moment. And what we notice is that there is a difference in terms of the, what you can resolve. Here is our somewhat industry standard shock capturing scheme with subcell resolution. You can see you get some, you, you, you seem to get high order accuracy in that you don't get staircasing effects or odd, odd uh, features. But if you compare this to this Gauss collocation schemes, I should mention this here at the end is an entropy projection based entropy stable scheme. You can get much finer scales that are resolved here in the density compared with this one out here. The, uh, the pressure you can see also looks very similar. They're both entropy stable. This subcell entropy, uh, this subcell limiting uh, scheme seems to give you more resolution in terms of features for density, but you also have some weird, possibly non entropic behavior in the pressure. And this applies, this is for degree P equals three. But if you look at P equals seven, you can basically see the same thing. You get good resolution with this uh, old shock capturing scheme, but this Gauss collocation based entropy projection based entropy stable scheme gets much finer resolution. And you can even see this in the shock as you uh, get these nice little compression waves that echo throughout the Gauss, uh, the Gauss pressure. All of this again, run without any artificial viscosity, stability or filtering. All this is using is an adaptive runge cut a time stepper and entropy stable scheme. Jesse, the, yes. the, the large scale features are also different. Is that because different instances, different windows? What is, why? Okay. Yes. Okay. This is an excellent question. Uh, so this, I believe this is a problem of sensitivity to the numerical method. So what we also observe is that if we look between, this is degree uh, seven on a 16 by 16 mesh. This is degree three on a 64 by 64 mesh. And even between similar discretizations, if you change the numerical discretization, then you get very, very different overall features. I think since we're running this, this is also running until I should say T equals 25. So it's a fairly long time Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And I think that because of the chaos, you end up uh, having a macroscopic uh, solution features, which just look very different from each other that depend on the initial condition and are sensitive to discretization. Does that uh, answer what, uh, what your concern was? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so just to make sure we actually see this, we should actually compute some, some things. So we computed the energy spectra related to turbulence for these three cases and take these with a grain of salt. These may not be physical, but you can see that the energy spectra, which measures the amount of energy in high modes collapse onto a one dimensional uh, wave uh, spectra. This blue line is our entropy projection scheme. It retains the most energy in these high modes. This yellow line is our subcell, our, our state-of-the-art subcell positivity preserving limiting scheme. And it preserves more features, but it still preserves less in the high modes than this uh, entropy projection based scheme. Finally, if you look at the most classical or sort of most uh, mature type of shock capturing, it loses a lot more energy in these high modes than both of the similar schemes. So this is one reason why these uh, the inherent robustness of a method without additional limiting or shock capturing might still be of interest in certain applications. So with that, I want to conclude and say there are many different ways to construct entropy stable high order schemes. Uh, I hope I've uh, talked a little bit about two of them, and I would be happy to entertain any questions that you all have. With that, I'd like to thank you all for being here for this talk. Thank you very much for inviting me to give a very non-machine learning talk in a mostly uh, a machine learning expertise focused uh, seminar nowadays. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, we'll wait for some questions from our audience. Uh, hi, Jesse. Uh, this is Amir from Brown. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you talked about entropy table, uh, but is there any way we can make uh, the we can choose the entropy flux such that the scheme is both entropy stable and as well as entropy preser preserving? Uh, do you mean positivity preserving? Uh, uh, no, no, the, the entropy preserving scheme. Uh, because I, I know the work of uh, Chandrasekhar back in 2013, where he uh, he proposed such both entropy preserving as well as entropy stable scheme uh, in finite volume framework. Yes. So, uh, so to answer your question, uh, if uh, entropy stable is simply going to be where you dissipate the uh, the entropy, um, 
with Chandra Shekhar's flux, are you referring to the kinetic energy preservation? Yes, process? yes, exactly. Ah, nice. Okay, yes, exactly. So we actually use a uh, a recent a couple modifications of Chandrasekhar's flux. There is a flux from Renoka, which basically also preserves some steady states. But all the fluxes we use, we have to use the highest quality ones, ones that are kinetic energy preserving, entropy uh, conservative, and also preserve certain steady states for uh, for uh, 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 for the pressure and for the density. Um, Chandrasekhar's work was uh, was was instrumental, though it is. I, I would say by far one of the best fluxes to start with. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ahmad is uh, the. I, I, I have a question actually right now. Yeah, I can. Uh, why don't you turn on your camera? So Ahmad is the yeah. person who is actually using your code, uh, Jesse, and uh, ah, he's modifying hi, your Jesse, code. How are you? Hello, Ahmad. Uh, Nice to meet you. It's good, Hello. It's good nice that you told you us too. about Fluxo because uh, he's a Fortran guy, so he has to convert your code to Fortran and then back. Now he doesn't have oh, to. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I did it for a 1D problem, so it wasn't that difficult. So right. my question so my question is about uh, constructing the entropy conservative fluxes for hypersonic flows. As, as you know, look, like the relation between the, the energy and the temperature is complicated. And to drive the, the entropy variable and then take the averages, I tried to do that. And then the formulation was like 50 pages long. And it was like completely impractical to implement that. So my question is, do you have any way, any like uh, detour to, to to come up with the with the entropy with the entropy conservative flux for hypersonic flows. That is an excellent question. So I will say off the bat, I will be honest. I don't know as much about the construction of entropy conservative fluxes. I know that. So can I can I ask for clarification? Is the uh, yeah. the pressure equation is the equation of state is is it, it's a non-standard non-ideal gas? I assume is it like a Van der Waals equation of state or something similar? No, it's it's ideal gas equation of oh, state, okay. but but where we define the the energy. In, for total energy. The energy is dependent on temperature and you have like exponential functions, stuff like that. And then you need to take the average and then with the entropy variables, uh, like it's, it's just crazy, like the formulation. Sure. So, yes. so, so that's my question. That's uh, the question that I have. And then regarding the positivity preserving, when you apply them you, uh, in the reactive flow, when you have uh, reaction source terms. So how do they how do they work like in those kind of situations? Yes. So I can try and uh, let me try and address both uh, situations yeah. clearly. So if I don't know the exact uh, constituent relations that you're using in the in the energy equation, but if they are different from uh, from the standard ones, then yes, you would have to rederive all fluxes. And I yeah. don't know precisely how uh, that is. I don't. We don't have a, a way to do that in an algorithmic way yet. I do know that there are some folks in China who are working on uh, on. Uh, the basically the species aspect of hypersonic flow. So if you have reacting species, then they've yeah. introduced entropy stable fluxes for some of these uh, model species, model reaction type physics. Uh, one thing that you can potentially do, it is nice to get entropy stability for the entire problem, but if you have physics which make it impossible to do so, what you can sometimes do is reduce the problem and create and uh, uh, use an entropy conservative flux uh, for only part of the simulation. So if your energy equation, for example, is being uh, is is causing problems. There are actually entropy conservative fluxes for uh, let's say the uh, oh goodness the isentropic Euler equations. So you can apply you can adapt those you can combine those with standard DG fluxes to improve robustness of uh, of uh, your simulation of the mass and uh, momentum equations, and then simply try to apply standard stabilization techniques to the energy equation if the construction of entropy conservative fluxes is holding you back. This doesn't give you a guarantee, but what you should see is that at least for certain uh, situations, certain types of shocks and uh, unresolved features, you should see improved robustness still in those cases. But this is, addition, this is a weakness of entropy uh, stable methods that coming up with fluxes for very complex physics like yeah. Yeah. me tricky. For the positive preserving, I will just mention that the work of German Popov and uh, uh, Tomas and Meyer, the base of the work of the folks in AM, they cover the case of source terms as well, which I believe reaction terms would fall into. As long as the source terms uh, don't themselves cause a violation of, uh, of positivity uh, at very small time steps, 
then you should be okay. But I don't know the. I think they they're very stiff and they do. Like okay. When you so, have high temperatures and yeah. So if they are stiff though, so what what uh. uh like the time that the, the reaction time scale is very very low. Like. Yes. So I know that the um because the the group at AM also resolves the boundary the viscous boundary layer they also have suffer from stiffness through the discretization they do an implicit explicit treatment i don't know if they I, I would believe that you could do the same thing for the uh for the reactive case but the re i think positivity is a little bit tricky in that you will you will usually have to uh look at the specific form of the reactions so yeah in they're the, very tricky in the case of the imex scheme though uh, they use strain splitting, and because the strain splitting separates us into two specific problems, they were able to just say, well, we will reuse our proofs of positivity for the uh, inviscid problem, uh, generate a slightly different proof of positivity for the parabolic or the viscous problem. And if you were to adapt this to deal with uh, stiff reactive source terms, if you could prove positivity in that situation as well, then I think that this uh, you could you could then glue that together using uh, by adapting what they've done. What we've done here is for it, it wouldn't work for your situation as in any case because we are using a purely explicit formulation so stiffness would definitely kill your time step yeah thank you thank you hey jesse this is raj so can i ask raj? <laughs> hey jesse uh, i just had a question um, here's the... oh, oh sorry go ahead raj. Let, uh, not let raj because he's in germany sure. so he's uh, sure sure he's, uh, there's a delay yeah yeah, so, so Jesse, what is the upside for the model DG? Like, uh, in what case, like, uh, in comparison to nodal DG, what is upside for the model DG? And I have another question after that I will ask. So, yeah, let me see if I have any backup slides on uh, on this. Uh, shoot, I do not in this case. So, the, uh, the back, the advantage for modal DG. Um, Computationally, there's not as much advantage. There is this extra robustness that we've observed for modal DG formulations because it uses the entry projection. And there are a lot of cases, for example, on highly warped curved meshes, where we actually see that being able to over integrate to use a general uh, accuracy quadrature improves the accuracy significantly. You can get up to one order of accuracy higher with a modal DG scheme. Um, the computational time is, however, comparable to a one degree higher nodal DG scheme. So it's a little bit of okay. uh, equivalence. The reason we do the modal entropy stable formulations is more for flexibility. And then when we actually implement, we typically use either a nodal DG formulation or a Gauss collocation. Uh, these, we, we try to expose more structure for efficiency in our, in our uh, in implementation still. Okay, okay, okay. And also, does OCA have a Julia API? Like, OCA has Julia API? I don't believe so. There was originally a work for, uh, for there was originally a port for OCA, but I believe that's over six years old now and unmaintained. For, uh, for GPU stuff, I am, I am trying to learn this from some of our, some of, well, Lucas Wilcox at Brown, another, uh, yes, at, yeah. at uh, NPS, another Brown alumni, has yeah. a lot of work with Julia and GPUs. And yeah. we're going more the route of there's some Julia packages which uh, we use instead of Aka nowadays. Okay, so I have a Ju uh, C plus plus wrapper for in Julia, so I just wanted to integrate it with Trixie. Maybe I'll need some help with you. So sure, sure, yeah. Maybe uh, please also email me. I'd be happy to talk yes. with you about that. And sure. uh, uh, I don't think, but if if you send Aka through C plus plus, that should be fine. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you. Not to go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jesse, I'm curious if you've seen, there's some work from uh, Maxime Olshensky um, at Houston and also Mark Ritzma from the Netherlands, um, yeah. where they work on these, it's like these methods that conserve everything, but they augment uh, conservation laws with like a vorticity equation, and then you get subgrid conservation of entropy. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I, curious if, because it, it, it seems like, you know, like what I mentioned before, right? Like if, seems like this could apply there. And in terms of what you're trying to get, which is better subgrid conservation, that, that seems like an untapped extra dimension. You know what I mean? Like this, the the, um, the holistic conservation and, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, so so I I love the, those mimetic spectral methods. They, uh, they, are, they are very cool. So the problems I think that we focus on are somewhat different. I, I, I know that they, they're able to do this for the geostrophic shallow water equations, for example, where they 
So for that specific equation, an entropy stable scheme is actually equivalent to a non-standard splitting of certain uh, differential terms. So you essentially apply the product rule to certain differential uh, terms, and then you discretize the product rule version of that instead. Um, so for an entropy, I believe that they use something a little similar in certain cases to get their energy stability for these medic spectral element schemes. Uh, so the reason I haven't uh, looked as much into these for compressible Euler is because I you, you don't get the same structure. A compressible Euler, uh, I don't know of another way apart from these entropy stable schemes to get high order accuracy and entropy conservation. And in those case, in in our case, one thing we do sacrifice, we can only conserve one nonlinear invariant. So we choose entropy or the dissipation of entropy. The really nice thing about these medic spectral methods is because they have this additional structure, this kind of discrete DRAM sequence they get all these other uh, dis, uh, discrete quadratic and uh, cubic invariants like helicity and vorticity and so on for free. And that is something that we admittedly do not get even in our discretization of the shallow water equations. We just try and pump it high order enough to where the uh, conservation error is negligible, but we can't guarantee machine precision uh, conservation in those cases. Because they're, they're, they have this uh, hysterpolent, which yes. is basically like this way of interpolating it's how they get to high order while getting all this structure preservation and um, thematically it's very similar to the kind of stuff we've been talking about so you know it might be worth looking into maybe there's something there i've been mean to, to yeah i've been mean to uh, to check back at that in, uh, as as well i i'll let you know if we find something about it there there is i can tell you more about it offline but there is some there is some technical structure which makes it a little trickier uh, to directly extrapolate entropy stable schemes but if there's a way to do it, I would definitely be interested. Uh, Jesse, you, you mentioned the um, mesh generators of uh, David Copriva. Yes. Are they, are, they op, are they open source code? I, 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 Ahmad, do you know them? Uh, which one, George? From David Copriva, mesh generators. Oh, yeah, I should. Uh, oh, I yeah, think... yeah, I know, I know it, I know it. Yeah, it's called HQ something. Yeah, I, 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 H, I yeah. H O H Q. Um, yeah, mesh yes. Uh, so I should I should note that the mesh these mesh generators they can automatically generate quadrilateral meshes, um, or semi automatically generate quadrilateral meshes. So you, if you have let's say a sharp uh, feature like like the tip of a, of a of an airfoil, then you may still have to manually refine around that area. Yeah, we we have that problem right now. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A water turbine, not an airfoil, but a water turbine. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I, so it's a, but is it, this a 2D or 3D mesh generator? This is, a, this is a 2D mesh generator with limited 3D capabilities. I believe he can handle things like mapped 3D meshes or extruded 2D, 3D meshes. Oh, extruded, yeah, that's easy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is somewhat straightforward. In, in full 3D, I, I think he uses uh, planar properties of curves, which don't generalize to 3D in the same way. So... Uh, I don't know of a, actually, if you find a uh, robust 3D mesh generator, I would also be very interested if it works for quads, sorry, for hexes. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I know, I know a mesh generator uh, called Grid Pro, but, but you need to pay for it, so. Ah. <laughs> so if, so they give you, they give you like 200 blocks uh, version, you can use 200 blocks. And uh, if you do like academic work, they give you the license for that. So you can ask for that. OK, thank you. So that's like, it's called Grid Pro. Okay, let me put it in the chat. Uh, Jesse, who has uh, developed the Fluxo? I think you mentioned who has who, which team has developed Fluxo? Absolutely. So Fluxo, I believe, is uh, primarily Klaus Dieter Moons uh, in, uh, in, in Germany. And um, I know that Gregor Gassner, Florian Hindenlong, Klaus Dieter Moons and some other uh, graduate students and postdocs are primarily the development team. Okay, so Gassner is involved in that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Gassner, yeah, Gassner is heavily involved in both, and which is why uh, I, I, I don't think we would have been comfortable comparing the two unless we unless you had we, we had someone who was involved with developing both to give a fair comparison. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, great, great. Trix is a, is a great code. I, I've seen a lot of codes, but uh, I really like uh, Trix. It's also very fast. Uh, Raj made um, show it to me, and I said, "Okay, this is what I wanted thirty years ago." <laughs> we are 
That is amazing to hear. I've, I, I mentioned this to the Trixie development team, by the way, and they almost couldn't believe it. They said, wow, we are, this is very surprising to, uh, to get the uh, attention of, uh, well, essentially the crunch group. So I, was, I was talking to uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking to the Air Force about Trixie actually. Oh, so, wow. uh, because uh, Ahmed made a, right, a survey of all the existing hypersonic codes, and there's no single code that actually can do anything useful right now. That's the problem. So it's a national crisis. There's no, not a single code that can do it. They do, they basically have first order codes and they call them, and then they have high order fluxes. But they say, but we use high order fluxes. <laughs> but uh, Ahmed, has men Ahmed mentioned there are other problems that uh, we'll be happy to uh, interact with you and, uh, and tell you about all our problems. <laughs> We would be delighted to have more problems to, to look at and try. And Ahmed, if you uh, if you end up trying Trixie or have any questions, please do interact with us on the Slack channel yep. or the page. And yeah, we would we would love to help uh, help you develop this. We're interested in solving uh, solving interesting problems too. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I will contact you for sure. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you very much for stopping by. It was a great talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to uh, to meet you in person. Uh, I of course have used your work for God knows how long. So it's nice to put a face to the, the book. Thanks. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. So now we'll move to our last talk of uh, today. And it would be by uh, Theo. Theo, you may want to share your screen. Uh, you're muted. So that I, you're gonna say who is Theo? Uh, I, uh, you want to introduce? Oh, no, you, uh, or maybe, maybe Vivek. Vivek can say a few things. Okay, yeah, Vivek can introduce. Is Vivek there? No? Yes, 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 yes I'm here, Professor. Yes. Theo joined Crunch Group as an uh, in intern in end of May, and he has been working uh, with me and Professor Karnidakis. He did a really good job. He he started the point in which he didn't know what deep learning is and see what he has done. He, he'll show it yours, uh, him, uh, himself. Yep. Theo is an undergrad student at Williams College. Yes, Theo, I think you can uh, go on from here. Yeah, yeah. I'm a math and physics double major at Williams College and I have um, some research background in computational biology, but um, Vivek's been a great mentor and I've learned a lot. So I'm just kind of, I'm going to split up the presentation into kind of two small parts. I'll quickly go over kind of the basics of what I learned. And then kind of in the second half, I think like the best way to learn is just to like try to make modifications and see what happens. So um, I'm going to present some of the ideas I had and the lessons I learned. Um, and then, yeah, so some of the ideas are very much in their infancy, but I had a lot of fun. Yeah, so okay, first started off just learning basic deep learning models, kind of starting off, you know, just just a, just a vanilla feed forward network. Then I learned how to do um, pins and I used the Vanderpaul, so I mainly worked with the Vanderpaul oscillator, which is a nonlinear ODE that is used to model li limit cycles in electrical circuits. It was more useful because it's a pretty easy equation to learn um, and doesn't require that much computational power. And it's interesting because we have a mu parameter that we can tune. So if mu equal to zero, then we just have simple harmonic motion, which is very easy to learn. And then we can increase mu. So for example, what I learned was mu equal to one with some observation points. Um, and that kind of brings in a little bit more steep and kind of like shock values. Um, so the first kind of modifications I made was I learned how to use the LBFGS optimizer and I investigated transfer learning. So, L, so LBFGS is great to combine with transfer learning because you need to kind of train first with Atom before you utilize LBFGS's capability to, to, um, to approximate the Hessian um, and, and, and get faster convergence. Um, what I tried to do is that I first trained with LBFGS and then often it would kind of converge at a non, at, at, at kind of like a local minimum, but it would, it would kind of be still far off from the final solution. So then I'd alternate, so, so I'd start with Adam, then train with LBFGS, then train with Adam for another 200 epochs, and then, and then LBFGS. So that's what we see kind of 
you know, um, periods of pretty quiet training and then a big jump when we kind of switch back to Adam. And we can see that transfer learning, you know, if you start at zero epochs, so just starting with LBFGS, you get really poor performance. But if you start transfer learning after 200,000 epochs for the mu equal to one equation, um, then you can actually learn the mu equal to 0.7 solution very quickly and very accurately. Um, so yeah, so I really got in, invested in learning about self-adaptive weights, which has been developed by Levi and, 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 and Ulysses from Texas A&M. Um, so self-adaptive weights are great because they allow the model to provide optimal weightage to each data point. So we kind of parameterize our loss term with a lambda R, which represents all the, which represents the weights for all the PDE data points. And then lambda O, which is, allows you to parameterize the weights for all the um, kind of observational data points. So that's like initial conditions, boundary conditions. Um, yeah, so then we kind of have the loss terms. So, 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 so this is the PDE loss term. And we see that we have a G, we kind of have a masking function which is a strictly increasing function with a positive first derivative. Um, the types it presented in the paper that I experimented with, with either a polynomial function raised to a positive degree or, or a sigmoid function. And then, yeah, and then and this is how the two loss terms are transformed. So then we, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize our our, um, our lambda terms, which are the weights on each point, and we're trying to minimize the weights in, and we're, and we're, and we're, trying, we're, we're trying to minimize training loss with respect to the weights and biases. So we're performing gradient ascent, and the gradient of the lambda terms is just the first derivative of our masking function and the error of that point. So the whole point of having a positive first derivative is that um, our, our lambda value only stops increasing when the loss goes to zero. And, and, and so pretty much what lambda becomes is lambda is proportional to the, to the cumulative error of the ith point. And I found that the having a quadratic masking function performed a lot better than a sigmoid um, masking function. I think part of that is that the quadratic masking function really kind of emphasized the architecture of the adaptive weights, whereas for sigmoid, you kind of initially have some differentiation, but then as lambda gets very large, um, all the weights kind of converge to the same kind of maximum of the sigmoid function. So what, so what I started experimenting with was I was wondering if we could add a normalization constraint to adaptive weights. And the idea behind this would be to allow like high residual points to retain a large lambda value, but low residual points would decay um, in order to appease the, the normalization parameter. Because the whole thing is that lambda is proportional to cumulative error. So then therefore, towards the end of training, we could have some points with a high lambda value, but a low error because the models already learned it. So if we add this kind of lambda normalization constraint, then we can, mo then we can modify the gradient to be the loss to be the first derivative multiplied by the loss at that point minus the no minus the, the normalization error for either our our data our data points or our PDE points, and the whole point is that if you have high error if you, if you still have high error you'll kind of you'll ignore this normalization term but if you have low error then the normalization term will take over. Um, and I saw that initially we it performed quite well but it converged quite poorly and I think. The idea behind this is that kind of we're adding this additional constraint and it's kind of interfering with the ability of the adaptive weights to perform kind of how it wants to perform. And then and, and then I think this kind of leads to kind of like in the in the sigmoid case, we have less differentiation between each adaptive weight. I also implemented residual based adaptive refinement from the deep end from the uh, deep XDE paper. Um, so what we do is RAR, is RAR starts training with a low number of collocation points. And it, and it kind of, as training goes on, it randomly samples new possible collocation points and computes the error of each one. And then it adds points to its training data set with the highest error. 
So kind of the really neat trick behind this is that early on in training, you don't need too many collocation points in order to kind of approximate the general solution. And then as you're getting to fine tuning, maybe you go from a hundred to a thousand collocation points. And, and that allows you to kind of spend less computational resources early on in training. And then I implemented it by combining it with the adaptive weights. And I found that the best model would be, because in a way, um, RAR kind of acts as adaptive weights because you're adding data point, you're adding similar data points. So, so, like, so like, let's say if you have a current data point with high error, and then you randomly sample a data point that's kind of locally nearby that also has high error, you're kind of adding to the number of data points that are in that local region. And therefore you're kind of increasing the weight of that point. So I actually, I actually found my best performing model didn't, didn't even have any adaptive weights for the collocation points. And we only had adaptive weights for the data points. I think also what's responsible for this increased performance is that by only having um, adaptive weights for the data points, because I'm, I was working with a toy problem, we were able to kind of emphasize data loss. And because we have you know, high fidelity data, the model will learn better on high fidelity data than PDE points. So then this realization, let me start thinking about tuning the hyperparameters on PDE loss and loss from observed data or, or, or boundary conditions. Um, and in general, we can't just apply the, we, 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 we can't just apply the technique of the adaptive weights because then our alpha values will just become proportional to the cumulative error of PDE loss or data loss and implementing that results in PDE loss and data loss kind of um, um, being considered equally by the model. But there are times like if we have really high fidelity data, we wanna focus on the high fidelity data and kind of almost ignore PDE loss a little bit. So what I actually did, and I just wanna credit Adar for kind of suggesting this when I was asking about general things is what we do is that let's say we train for a hundred, if we, we train for a hundred epochs, and then we'll create two trial runs, which are kind of dummy models that load in the weights at a hundred epochs, and they and 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 we make some perturbation to the weight. Like we add, you know, we 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 either emphasize uh, data loss or we emphasize PDE loss, and then I'll go over how we evaluate, and then we train for ten epochs, and then I I'm going to go over how we evaluate. Using the, his, using the history of our training loss terms, how we evaluate how each model performed, and then we update our local loss weights accordingly. So how do we actually evaluate how our trial runs go? So first I take a running average of the last 100 training steps um, for each loss component. So this is the, the average data loss, and this is the average PDE loss. And then I compute, and then I compute the percent difference um, though, uh, though I, do, I divide by the current loss. So if we get a huge decline in loss, then, then, the, then the, this value will go up in magnitude. Um, and it's important to know that we want our S kind of our, 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 our S function to be negative because, or, or like, or like for S being negative, that's a good sign because that means our loss is kind of smaller than the average loss. That means it's actively improving. I then pass our S kind of our S values through a masking function, because pretty much what I want to do is I want to reward exploration because often during training, especially in Adam, it can be kind of noisy and we'll have times where we kind of perform worse and then we kind of have some brilliant moment where we kind of have a huge, where we kind of a huge jump down in training loss. So I was trying to, by having positive, by having kind of actually worsening performance, just go to zero and then kind of taking the square, because the X values are usually very, very tiny, having the square root amplifies these well-performing moments. So then we kind of, so then the whole point of taking the percent differences of each loss term is so that we can kind of compare them because let's say if PDE loss is on the order of 10 to the negative three and data loss is on the, is on the order of 10 to the negative five, we, it, 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 if we didn't kind of take this percent difference, then we would only kind of, then we would only be able to evaluate it on the higher loss term. And then, so then, so then this is how we evaluate over Q. So we kind of compute, let's say if we're training for 10 epochs and there's four mini batches per epoch, then M would be 40 in this case. So then we take the average of how it performed over all 40, over all 40 training steps. And 
so then so then this is a Q value. So then Q of O is the evaluation of the trial trial run with an amplified data loss weight, and Q of R is the evaluation of a trial run with an amplified PDE loss weight. And kind of going back, we 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 plug these Q values into um in, into our update. And I like for, I mean you can do a lot of different schemes or how you update epsilon, but I chose like epsilon to be 0.1. Yeah, and let's see how it performed. So it's actually interesting that kind of contrary to where I sometimes have better performance when I manually increased the data hyperparameter, I actually found that so that so, so the model performed, but so 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 I just used this implementation with a vanilla pin, and it performed pretty similar to the app for to the adaptive weights. Though the convergence was a little bit slower, but I actually saw that the entire time actually alpha. So what I'm plotting here is the normalized version of alpha. So that's why. Both values always sum to one. So these are the kind of the effective weights in each data loss on each loss term. And I saw that actually emphasizing PDE loss kind of led to better performance than just having kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence, which is the yellow line. Um, I also think that future implementation, it would be kind of interesting to detect when when we've kind of converged our loss, our loss weights, because we're spending a lot of time, you know, like every hundred epochs. We're, we're wasting 20 epochs pretty much in order to find out these new values. So for it to not change at all, we're really wasting training and it could really speed it up a lot. And then I also implemented with adaptive weights. And I think a bit more is going on because when you have adaptive weights, um, those adaptive weights can kind of influence the overall, like if, if you look at kind of the mean value of the adaptive weight, um, that can kind of influence the relative importance of each loss term. So I think this is kind of battling or, or, or this is kind of getting not only input of trying to find a well-performing loss weight, it's also kind of like the, like the adaptive weights are constantly shifting. But we see that there still is some improvement over the, adapt, the quadratic adaptive weights model, but not that much. Um, and also this is computationally expensive. It, 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 empirically, it's, it's slower to run than even 20% because I think loading in, loading in two, two new models at every hundred epochs, this takes a lot of computational resources. Yeah, and then if I have time, um, I kind of included this as like an afterthought, but the last thing I learned about was the spin architecture. This is most recently. Um, so this is a paper that uses lie symmetry in order to kind of more effectively learn PDEs. Um, I did some reading about lie symmetry and I'm still a little, little confused, but Pretty much the like the gist of it is is that there are times when knowing a differential equation kind of fundamentally that adds an extra constraint, um, which I'll show an example with the linear heat equation. So, for example, in this PDE, which is a second order differential equation, um, the kind of the, 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 the lie symmetry informs us that this G equation must also be true. And in general, the kind of constraints provided by lie symmetry. Are, are less nonlinear and lower order than the original differential equation. So they're easier to learn. Um, and also these additional kind of constraints provide, um, it, 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 pro it provides a direction for the neural network in the high dimensional hyperspace kind of to like see which way it should optimize. And I, and I found that the spin performed better. Um, I would like to thank Vivek for being a great mentor and, Karna, and George Karnadaktis for providing this opportunity. And I hope I can apply these skills. You know, I feel like the point of the summer is just to gain a lot of skills and I can apply it towards my computational biology thesis in the fall. Thank you, Theo. That was excellent. Maybe we can hear from George. Good first, can I ask a quick question here? Of course. Yeah, so Theo, um, you showed that your loss uh, decays faster than vanilla pin, for example, but how much did you evaluate the cost of each epoch is compared to vanilla pin? I, I, I actually, I, I mean, I need to do that. I need, I need to get more advanced than like being able to really like evaluate. I mean, I guess I have like time, but computation, but also be running multiple things. Um, okay. I mean, empirically, I'd say, I mean, it's empirically, I'd say, I don't think there's much here because empirically, it took a lot of time, like just like like running a hundred thousand epochs, you know, on my laptop, like 
kind of doing uh, either a vanilla pin or an adaptive weights pin was much faster than the kind of like like the 20% estimate that I provided. Because what you have to do is you have to load in a new model, you have to create a new model, load in the weights for the test run, and you're doing that twice per 100 epochs. Um, right. Thank you. But I, but I think yeah, that that would be interesting to try to like re actually like rigorously evaluate. Thanks, Theo. And uh, with that, we come to an end for today's seminar. I, uh, I wish you all have a great weekend and uh, let's wish Haley and uh, Theo a very happy farewell. Thank you.